Hey, what's up garden friends? Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. How's everybody doing? Hope you're good, I'm great. Pulling out part two of the house plant tour here. I did everything on this half of the grow space a few days ago, maybe a week ago. I don't really know when this is gonna come out. The video prior to this one talked about just about everything over here. Still haven't fixed the upside down orchid. I will do that soon, like in a few minutes, hopefully. There are only a few things over here I didn't talk about just because I totally forgot. So we can talk about those. So in place of the normal Saturday vlog, I'm gonna go through and talk about everything that's going on over here on this side of the growth space. Probably won't be as lengthy as the other half because everything that was over here like required updates. There are things that have been talked about in the videos before like the Monstera, the bird's nest ferns, the croton, the anthuriums and the lime tree and, and all the things. If you saw the video, you know what I'm talking about. But a lot of what's over here, like most of y'all don't even know what's over here. So that's, it's like annuals and those sort of, why, don't, why am I talking down my own video? That's not how you should do things. It's gonna be fantastic. Everything's gonna be great. One of the plants I didn't talk about that I had intended on and just totally forgot was the tree fern, which is over here and kind of hard to see. It only has one frond on it but it like was almost dead a couple months ago, so I'll take it. Hasn't been the easiest plant to grow, but I do, and I've said this, if you've been watching the channel, I say it over and over again, I think the main problem with that plant was the potting media that it was in. Ever since I repotted it, it's been, well, I can't really, I mean, if you see that, I can't say it's been doing wonderfully, uh, but it was like on death's door. It got some cold damage on it, and the tree ferns are one of those plants that like they'll look like everything's fine, then all of a sudden it'll just be like, oh, it, it, they're just dying, like out of absolutely nowhere. So they don't really let you know things are wrong. At least that's been my experience with this plant over the last, what, year, year and a half, however long I've had it, where it'll be like, I'm good. It just seem like everything's fine. And then next thing you know, like the fronds are starting to yellow and fall off from either getting too much water or not enough water or too much sunlight or not enough sunlight. Why well, I haven't, I've given it too much sunlight before. I don't think I've stuck it in enough shade. That's why it looks so beautiful right now. Traditionally, they can take a little bit of light, but that just hasn't really been my experience with that plant. Anyways, you get the point. It's bouncing back and you know, it's only one frond, but I'll take it. Down here have the ginger that's, I mean, I can't say is looking great. It's looking a lot better than it was. Last time I showed it here on the channel. This one also was a plant that uh, went a little bit too long without repotting it and it, it suffered, as you can see here. It really probably should have been repotted early to midsummer, something along those lines, and uh, I just forgot about it, and then I moved all the plants into the garage and the grow space. If you didn't know, this is actually my garage just with plastic up and all kinds of things to make it grow spacey. It had gotten to a point where I couldn't, I, I could not keep this plant hydrated. No matter how much I watered it, it was just like, nah, I'm gonna die. So I did repot it, but not the most ideal timing for that repot. It was like, what, November, something like that. And uh, it's doing better. I actually, it does need a watering. I still haven't watered. I'm picking up right from where I left off in uh, last week's video. And I had mentioned that I'm on the tail end of watering. So some things are going to be a little bit more dry. There are gonna be a lot of things that need some work on them. That's kind of the point of the video. So I can walk around, see things up close. So sometimes it's helpful for me to walk around with the camera and get a different perspective on things a little bit and go, oh, that looks pretty bad. Because when you have a lot of plants, sometimes you sit back and look at them 
in like a broad picture. And for myself, sometimes I can have a bad habit of not actually getting in on the plants like each individual one. That's a newer problem. Ever since last summer, I've just been like, eh, they're fine, which isn't really true. And then you get things like this going on down here. So I'm going to be readjusting my habits here. I kind of have to. The ginger's looking better. It's just, I mean, it still looks sad and pathetic. I did have a lot of questions on this plant when I did the repotting, just when it comes to growing them indoors in general. And there were a lot of people who wanted to know why I didn't just go ahead and cut it back because that is totally an option with the alpinias. You can just come in and cut them back and let them hang out dormant for the winter time. And really that's a much easier way to do things and probably what I would advise people to do. The only reason I like to keep some growth on them, it doesn't have to be beautiful, perfect, healthy looking growth. Cause it's not like this isn't in my home. So it doesn't bother me having the plant look like this. I just want to get it through winter. These only flower on old wood. So if I were to go ahead and cut, come down here and cut that down to soil level and uh, let it store for the winter time as a dormant plant, then I wouldn't get flowers out of it next summer. And the flowers aren't spectacular, but they're pretty enough that I like them. And it makes me happy seeing the flowers. They just, they're like, they're pendulous flowers that come out hang and swoop a little bit in there, white with a hint of pink on them. It's a, they, they look like a chain of shells. It's a shell ginger. That's how it got that name. So that's why I try and carry them through winter, but I don't necessarily try and make them like thrive and grow robustly. I just want them to like hang out and like be okay. And then as soon as it's warm outside, I pop them out into the sun, give them plenty of water and well, part sun and they whoop, pop right back and look great within a matter of weeks. So it's just, it's one of those things where the juice isn't worth the squeeze to me <laughs> to try and keep it so happy that the plant's growing just abundantly because they need a good amount of heat for that. And indoors, they need a lot of light for that too. And uh, the space is heated, but I talked about in last week's video, how I'm keeping temperatures a little bit lower than I used to. And by lower, I just mean like 65 to 75 as opposed to 75 to 85 which is what I used to do, just to ease the maintenance, ease the spread of bugs and those sorts of things. Step things down a little bit so I can kind of chill and relax and appreciate the plants instead of just having to constantly work. Cause that's a lot of work when the temperatures are up in here. Okay, so that's the ginger. I will be giving that a water in the next week's, and, and the vlog that comes out after this one, I'll be doing the things that I talk about that need to be done in this video. It's a timing thing. I can't quite get it all done in one video and it's supposed to be really nice here over the next few days. And I have a few bigger plants need to be repotted. And I'll actually be able to take them outside to do that, which is very unusual for late January, but I'm not complaining. I'll take it. I'm happy about that. Another plant that needs an update is this Eureka Palm. It's not much to look at right now. When I brought this in, I went ahead and pulled and cut most of the fronds off because this one always has really intense mealybug issues. Every year when I bring it in, I cut most of the fronds off, give it a really heavy spray and a heavy wash and have to stay on top of it. But I mean, I can even see from right here, there's a spear coming out right there that despite this being sprayed just preventatively, every single week I've been spraying out here, still, it's got mealies on it. It's just a struggle every winter with those mealybugs. The, ever since I got those things, they're a huge pain in the butt. I've tried everything, the soaps, oils, rice water, I mean, all kinds of elixirs that the space is too big for rubbing alcohol to be a practical solution, though I do use it. Uh, soap, really just diluted dish soap, like a few drops into a big uh, two gallon sprayer has been working fairly well. And uh, now that all my plastics up out here, I'm going to be doing a pretty decent application of DE powder after I do my next watering, which will probably be now, probably tomorrow morning, I'm gonna do a watering and then do DE out here and let that sit for a few days. So we'll probably be spotting some critters, some flying things and some crawling things on the plants, but that's just kind of to be expected, at least with my plants, unfortunately. But all hope is not lost. We can get rid of those things. The areca palm is growing. It's opened up a few new fronds since it had its heavy prune back uh, in, what was it, November? And this is a little bit slower than most years, but I also haven't had the temperature quite as high as I usually do. So usually by late January into February, this is filled out almost completely from like completely bounced back. I mean, from having cut the old fronds off uh, this year, yeah, not so much <laughs> because I just kind of was letting it chill, letting it stay more on the cool side. Bird of Paradise are doing very well. That's not really surprising though. They're always troopers. 
The two that I have in here also get a very heavy prune, just like that Eureka palm does in the fall when I bring them in. Just be really, there's just not space for them to be fully flushed out. They have such a wide footprint that they end up shading a lot of plants. So I just give them a heavy prune, cut a bunch of the foliage off and then wait again, just like with the ginger to take them outside and they flush right back out. They've always done fine that way. I haven't noticed bug problems on them this year like I have in years prior, which is surprising and alarming at the same time because I'm not convinced that the bugs are, I mean, we just saw the stuff going on over there on the Eureka Palm. So I'm feeling like they're getting ready to just pop out and just make everything really hectic and chaotic. Like out of nowhere, it's just gonna be an explosion of bugs. Now, usually the undersides of these leaves get a bunch of mealies on them, but so far, they seem to be preferring the Eureka Palm. Now, if I was into systemics, I would give that a shot on the Eureka Palm because they're really drawn to that plant. The Eureka Palm and the Cordolins, the Cordolin fruticosas, which you can't really see them. There's one back, you can't see it. The, where's the other one? There's one in there. That pinkish foliage behind that frond. Those are plants that the mealybugs really seem to be drawn to. So those would be like host plants and it would be pretty effective to go ahead and treat just those plants and maybe solve this problem. It's just, you know, the systemics can be so risky and not really great for the environment when they flush out from the soil and they linger in the soil for a few months after you use them. So I just can't bring myself to do it. But maybe if I did, then wouldn't really have this bug problem anymore. The natural things work just fine. I think we all know that. It's just a matter of really making sure to stay on top of it. They're holding up well, and even though they were pruned heavily, they're still growing like champs. Popping up, nice big new leaves. Seems like about every other week they shoot a new one out. And you can see there's a fun one starting to pop. You can't see it. There is a new growth starting to come out of the middle of both of these. So they might be due for another prune here soon. I don't know. I do enjoy seeing some of the foliage. I mean, I don't like to cut them down completely. That wouldn't really be very good for the plant. They need some chlorophyll. They need to keep growing a little bit. It's good for now, but it's when they start to come in and sort of encroach and shade other things. That's when I have to come in and pull them out because you can see the ficus that's down here that I just have sitting on top of the soil for this areca palm. Not really getting as much light as it probably should. So I need to do some pruning, get that leaf out of there. Oh, and down here inside of the Eureka Palm, the uh, Brazilian fireworks are starting to put up their winter display of flowers. This plant usually flowers for me just about year round. For the most part, there's uh, some dead stuff near to prune out of this plant below it. But they do tend to kind of have a lull with the flowers. Around September, October, probably, the flowering slows down on them. They pump out some fresh growth during that time and then they resume flowering. The foliage on these is fantastic. It's a really pretty deep green with that silvery veining that runs through there. This actually is a plant that deserves its own spotlight. These are fantastic house plants and the flowers on them, right now it's hard to tell. They're absolutely beautiful. This is an old flower head, so there's not much you can tell from it. The bracts on them are a nice pink color. The more light they get, the more vibrant that tends to be, though these don't like direct light. They still a little bit more light would probably color those flowers up some more. And they have purple flowers that pop out of the bracts. I'm trying to see. Oh, here's one. It's a better shot. See those cute little like light purple flowers that pop out. And uh, depending on the time of year for me and the amount of light they're getting, these flower heads, the bracts will be a little bit taller than this, more like this one up here right there that didn't want to focus. And so you can imagine when they're this big, that's a much more impressive flower when it's nice bright pink with the purples coming out the sides. They start down low, work their way up, keep on going. And once it's done, this will start to dry out and fizzle out. Similar to the Athalandras and Talansia's bromeliads, it's the same kind of style, the way they come up in a slow succession until, until they're done. And they're generally pretty long lasting. That's why I think this is such a great house plant because they don't need much light. They're not very fussy about their watering. They're a plant that also like, if they do get too dry, they'll let you know the leaves will hang down and start to look well dry. You can tell when they need to be watered is what I'm saying. They're not super complicated. They don't need gross, crazy amounts of humidity and they do fine with bright and direct light. So why would you not want that in the house? Especially when they have pretty flowers. It's so hard to find house plants that flower reliably 
This one's always been a trooper. I've probably had this one for like eight, nine years or more in there. I've had to cut it back a few times, but it's always been a really sturdy plant. Right now it's growth habits a little bit unruly and wonky. That's partially just the time of year. When I get this outside during the summer, it tends to get a little bit more full depending on how far I decide to push it with sunlight. It is potted underneath a plant that does like <laughs> really good bright light. So that's probably a little bit confusing. Where I set this pot during the summertime, it's up against a wall and I have it angled to this corner. Is It's essentially shaded from the sun by the palm tree. So the only downside to that is I don't really see this plant very much during the summer. But when I pop my head around the side, when I'm watering the plant, I get to appreciate it and can check in on it, make sure it's doing all right. It's done really well like that. Just stay, making sure it only gets the morning sun from the side of the pot and then filtered light to shade throughout the rest of the day. Here's one of the cordolins. You probably knew what I was talking about anyways, but that's what I'm talking about. Cordolin fruticosa, mealybugs love these plants. And they haven't been bothering my dracaenas. This right here is a dracaena limelight, yes? Dracaena limelight. This is one of those plants where I know the name, but I always confuse it with the name of another one. This might be one of my favorite Dracaenas of the ones with the larger, broader leaves, like more of like the office plant type Dracaenas. It has been so sturdy, so reliable. It really, I don't think this plant has given me any trouble at all, ever. See, right now, I need to get in. There's a little bit of soil that's splattered onto those leaves here that need to get cleaned off of the plant. But yeah, overall, fantastic plant. If you want a Dracaena for in the house, this is one of the ones I would recommend because it's been so sturdy. The bugs don't seem to bother it. It doesn't really throw any fits when, you know, the, it's getting a lot of water versus when it's not because it's is outside for a big chunk of the year. So we go through dry spells and really wet spells. It's always good, no matter what. It's just like, yeah, I'll take it. I love plants like that. I love plants that are laid back and just go with the flow of things. But imagine I probably need to, yeah, I was gonna say, I bet this needs a lot of cleaning up on the inside. I've never done any pruning on this one. So it still has all of its original foliage down here from like two or three years ago. And that's going to start to yellow as time goes on. That's somewhat normal. These can hold onto their leaves for a really, really long time. Like eventually they'll just look like a pole covered in leaves. But when I bring them inside, it's harder to get light down to that lower growth. So I was expecting that as this got bigger, eventually I was going to need to probably come in here and do some pruning and get all that stuff cleaned out. Yeah, you can see. Definitely need to come in here and pull these out. It's, it's easy enough to do, just come in and pull them out. Just haven't gotten around to it yet. Great plant, highly recommend. It's one of the Duramensis, which are like the Janet Craig's. There's the regular and the compacta, which you can kind of see from looking at it, which are also like just fantastic Dracaenas. Great to have in the house because they're just sturdy and tough. What I like about the limelight is, well, it's the, I mean, look at the foliage. Isn't it beautiful? I don't know how it's going to come across on camera on my viewfinder. It's looking a little bit yellowy, but it really is a very light green color, which is great to have around the house because it draws the eye in. It's nice outside during the summertime because during the day it pops when I have brightly colored things planted around it. Usually I'll put impatience and caladiums near these plants and that helps like pull some focus over there, but it stands out very nicely. And at nighttime because of the lighter color on there, even stands out nicely in the evening, which I love because that's my favorite time to be outside during the summer. I love the nice warm, humid, like kind of sticky, gross summer nights. I love for those, that's so beautiful. Yeah, it doesn't sound all that appealing, but it's like my favorite time to be outside and you get to see all the reflections coming off of everything. Nice glossy foliage reflects the light very well. Excellent plant, 10 out of 10 recommend. Yes, common and basic, but I don't see that as a bad thing. I think easily obtainable, that's something to aim for with plants these days, especially ones that are low fuss. Speaking of low fuss, there was a plant that I almost purged this year and wasn't going to bring inside, and that's the Dracaena marginata. Now, it doesn't look very good. It doesn't look good at all, but that's because I was I was gonna let it go. It was a plant that I've had for a long time and I was like, I'm bored with this and it doesn't do anything for me. So I left it outside in the cold because I don't want it anymore. And there's a, you know, COVID going on. So not really in contact with people to give my plants away, like just what I would have done in the past. 
Anyways, long story short, it took a hard frost, thought about it and decided this is, plant has grown flawlessly for me for years. Like I haven't had to do anything for it. I mean, you have to water it, fertilize it occasionally, but it just grows and grows and grows. Why would I get rid of this plant? I'm trying to simplify things in life. Why get rid of the things that give us the gift of growth without having to do anything to them? This Dracaena, as well as the limelight, both are going to get repotted here probably late February, early March, depending on the weather trends and how warm it's going to be. This is still in its little nursery can. Look at how this pot, it is in a teeny tiny pot considering how big this actual plant is. And this easily five feet tall. Got this in a vlog a couple of years ago while at a big box store for like, I don't know, $12. Had a bunch of annuals planted around it and it was a decent size. And I am a, really partial to the Dracaenas that haven't been top cut. The ones that just have nice straight stems on them. The, oftentimes the marginatas when they're in larger containers, they've been cut. So there's a cut right along that trunk there and they have growth that comes out the sides, which is fine, but that's the end of that growth. Once you cut these, they're not getting any taller from the main growth, only from the ones that come off the sides. And I like to be the one who's in control of deciding how tall I'm going to let the plant get before the cut is made. Does that make any sense? As you can tell which side of the plant was against the pavement, I laid it on its side just in case I was going to change my mind. This side was laying on the pavement. This side was exposed to the cold. It's going to be okay. It's a sturdy plant. It'll grow. I'm not really worried about it. I'm glad that I changed my mind and decided to go ahead and bring it in because like I said, why would I let this beautiful plant just die? It's done nothing wrong. It's been growing flawlessly. Most of the plants I was purging were things that are troublemakers and ungrateful. <laughs> you just work so hard to keep them alive and uh, they do their thing and grow for you, but not without having to put in a lot of work for them. And uh, that's rewarding and I do enjoy that, but I'm just trying to change up the way I've been doing things. I would like to relax and enjoy my plants more so than I used to, instead of it just being a constant labor of love. That's what it is, it's labor of love, but sometimes I've just realized over the last couple of years that I spend so much time working on the plants that I don't really get to sit back and enjoy them as much. So that's something I've changed and uh, I'm glad that I did. So I'm enjoying the plants more, appreciating them more and taking better care, which I mean, you can't really tell from the way some of them are looking. It's been an interesting year, let's leave it at that. Another plant that's going to be getting a repot is the seminal pink hibiscus, look at it. Oh, she's thirsty. Like I said, I'm on the tail end of watering. So I'll get a nice drink in the morning and that'll plump right back out and get that sheen back on the leaves. Things were a little bit drier in here than normal over the last like week, just because I had the humidifier off because I was working on some other electrical things. So it wasn't running like I was trying to keep it running. And that of course leads to things like this. This hibiscus, I normally keep on the other side where the lights are a little bit stronger or actually a lot stronger. It's a hibiscus and they like high light, right? But the people who are helping me get all my plants inside this year stuffed it over here and I said, that's fine, I'll move it later. But it's been doing okay. I mean, I know it doesn't look great. That's just because it's thirsty. Otherwise, it's been totally fine and uh, I don't see a reason to move it if it's fine. I won't get flowers out of it. That's like the one downside is there's not going to be enough light over here to keep it flowering all winter, but I'm okay with that. If I were to try and move it to the other side, underneath these bigger grow lights that are back there, it would put up a whole bunch of pink flowers, which is fun and I love that, but it would also require a decent amount more watering and care. And if it's willing to just chill back here and just get watered like every seven to 10 days, that's good with me. I think that's probably the way to do things. I have another Dracaena down here who needs more light. This is one of the Coloramas. So you can see the new growth that's coming out is that lighter color, which is fine. It's still pretty. When these are getting more light, the foliage on them is really bright, and really vibrant and absolutely lovely. I love it. But no, when they're just hanging out in the corner, not quite as beautiful and vibrant, that's okay. And I just found my parwar palm. I thought my helpers had thrown that away. Good to know. Need to dig that out of there. <laughs> I had no idea that was back there. Oh, poor parwar palm. They're tough. It's still been getting water, so that's good because when I water this back area, I do it from the other end and spray the water over to all the bromeliads that are hanging up here and everything that's up there comes down on the plants over here. And I don't do that when my fans aren't running uh, or if a fan is broken, but I have better fans this year and they seem to be keeping the air full up really well. So I haven't had to worry about mildew or funguses or 
anything of the sorts. It's all been pretty good so far. Amos less words, right? I'm actually gonna go ahead and lift that out of there. Oh, look at that. Oops, pants fell off. I need the pot too. Well, I'm glad that that showed up because like I said, I thought maybe the people who were helping me with my plants when I moved them in this year might have thrown it away. But no, here we go. And not looking half bad considering I thought that it was dead and not even here. Bad at all. Just need to get in there and clean it up and give that an extremely heavy soak. Man, it's probably so thirsty. I don't do this very often, but it could use a big enough soak to just let it go in the pond. That's where I'm gonna leave it overnight. There are air stones moving the water around, so it'll be okay there. Okay, <laughs> time for the shelves. This is where things get a little bit more complicated, but I think we can break this down fairly quickly. There's just a lot of little things. I don't think we need to touch on everything. Like it's pretty clear, cactus and succulents and an extremely thirsty peperomia. Also going to get repotted. I'm not going to wait until later in the month to repot this one though. If I do that, it will die. I'm gonna move that over to my desk, make sure that that gets repotted soon. That will be in the next vlog, but otherwise these are all cactus and succulents up here. I have some aloe vera leaves that just fell off my aloe. I don't know why I left them there, but that's where they are. Look at all the aerial roots coming out of this aeonium. Isn't that insane? Very dry right now and very thirsty. Everything is though. I don't need to say that about the plants. Right now they're all pretty dry and thirsty. I'm gonna do a watering, but look at all that. Okay, that's a plant that is ready for some more moisture. Those roots coming out, that's the plant saying, hey, I'm thirsty. Would you go ahead and give me a drink? That's what that is. Gaves, the uh, Pilo Sirius Azurius back there, which I love. I got that in a vlog also from Home Depot. I think it was like $18, which is not bad at all for a triple that size. That was a really good deal and it's so beautiful and vibrant. I've had them before where they were like kind of blue, but that one is just like, shockingly blue. Isn't that gorgeous? And it's an easy cactus too. I love an easy cactus. I know by definition, we tend to think of cactus as easy, but that's not always the case. Sometimes they can be a little bit finicky and have some weirder requirements at different times of the year, depending on where they're from. The stapilia here is doing very well. I had it hanging up where it was blocking things. So I had to move that down. This is a shelf that needs some uh, serious reworking. There are plants here that I wasn't necessarily planning on keeping. And I said, okay, we'll just bring them in, put them on the shelves, we'll see what happens. Even though some of them like the coconut palms, they took a freeze of 28 degrees. So yeah, you can see how they handled that. It's not great it's to be expected. So there's two of those. I'm just gonna chuck those. They're not going to come back. It's not likely. They're under a frost cloth, but still, I mean, no. Same thing always happened over here with these Washingtonias. These are the filibusta, which is the California sand palm. There's the California and the Mexican. Then there's the filibusta, which is a hybrid between the two. The uh, California fan palm has a uh, thicker, more wide trunk. That's the filibusta as opposed to the robusta. You would think robusta would be thicker and more robust, but it's not. The California usually is more big around in the trunk. And there's some differences sometimes in the petioles on the plants. And supposedly the California is a little bit more cold hardy. I don't know. Either way, these were seedlings and they were doing great. And then cold happened like to the coconuts. And well, they're still recovering. This one I thought was dead, but it's still pretty sturdy. So I'm going to come in here and give that a prune. I don't want to repot it just because I mean, look at it. It seems like a really weak plant to repot. So I, I don't. I don't really know what to do there. It's getting a good amount of light. The Washingtonians in winter time sometimes can be a, a little bit more difficult and when it's really humid. So this growth space is pretty humid and sometimes I've had issues with them with rot, even though I make sure to not water them until they absolutely need it. It's just something about the moisture in the air and like just being really on top of making sure that no water gets into those crowns. So far they've been doing okay because this one had defoliated pretty much completely and it's put out a new growth. Another one's coming out there and this growth is still sturdy over here. So maybe it will come back and bounce back. I don't know, probably not if I keep beating it up though while I'm talking. So yeah, that's what's going on there. The two coconuts, I think those should go. Gonna be doing some pruning on those Washingtonias. This is the philodendron or somatophyllum that is lickety split that got repotted in a video, I don't know, November, December, something like that. There's a lot of new growth coming out. It's been doing really well. I mean, it's a, it's 
them out of the film. These are so easy, really simple plants. Something else that I love about them, there's a hibiscus back there that's burnt up because I oversprayed it and it had aphids and I just kind of went a little bit overboard with the spray. My other somatophyllum doing well. This could use a repot also. The bigger the pot these get, usually the better the leaves come out and bigger. This has been in the same container for like two or three years. Say so it's definitely time to go ahead and give that an upgrade. It could use it. Maxillaria orchid, that's the coconut orchid. Doing great, even though it's getting a, a lot of light. Seems to be okay with it. It's doing fine back there. Rubber plant. Eh, I need to move this. I think it's been getting way too much water in this spot. I need to move this someplace where it's not going to get hit with water when I'm like doing a spray watering because, you know, they tend to just not do great if the soil stays moist all the time, at least not for me. They need a little bit more of a dry period. So this one has lost some foliage, but it's putting out, actually it's been putting out a decent amount of new growth so far this winter, but it looked really bad when I brought it in here, like really, really, really bad. I'd set it with plants and told the people who were helping with my plants don't water it, but that's for some reason that was just a really hard thing to grasp. I can understand. Sometimes it's, you just feel like you need to water everything, but that one, it didn't appreciate it. Alocasia down here. This is an Odoro Okinawa Silver. There's a variety on this one. I have a bunch of these. A lot of them started to revert, so I'm going to have to cut those back completely and start them over and hope that the variegation returns on them. Where is one so I can show you? Yeah, there's a couple of them back there. They started to revert. So when that happens, what I've usually done is I will cut them back completely and put them in really bright light and just start the entire plant over it. And if what comes back up from that main growth doesn't come out variegated, then usually it will put up offshoots that normally some of them will have variegation on and I can pull them. That's always worked for me. I've only had to do that twice when I say that's always worked. I have a ton of experience with it because I haven't had to do it a bunch. I, Cause I, I've had these Okinawa silvers for Oh, six or seven years. Those two specifically. This is like the mother plant. I think I got it from, may have been Ken's philodendron or no, there's a, did I say philodendron? Doesn't matter. There was a site, I don't know if it's still around, called Real Flora. And they had these, I don't know, they were like $12, something like that back in the day. And I had a whole bunch of them. And uh, this is what I ended up holding on to. And it's been great, but a nice plant. Really easy to grow as far as the LOKCs are concerned. It has a smaller size to it, so it's not as much of an issue keeping it going during the winter time. I don't have to let it die back and go dormant like I do my bigger ones. Speaking of the bigger ones, this is the uh, Alocasia macrohyza. It is variegated. Its newest growth has me a little bit concerned. There's not much color on there, but it's also winter, so I'm trying to not read too much into that. It's not getting quite as much light. It's not even growing as much, but this is, look at that growth. I, can you see it? Oh, that's a pretty one. Way, way, way down there and I can't even get to it. Typically this one has had better variegation than the Okinawa Silvers. This leaf doesn't have as much on it. So it's not getting as much light as it does throughout the rest of the year either. So I'm gonna try to not read into that too much, but I'm keeping an eye on it. Don't you revert on me. I don't, I don't appreciate the plants with the reversion. That's why I won't buy expensive variegated plants that revert. If it reverts, I don't want it. With the exception of the alocasias. Now I started buying these several years ago before I knew that they would even revert. There wasn't a lot of information out there about that sort of situation about variegation and reversion. I mean, I guess there was, but it wasn't like in your face. Do you know what I mean? It was something I would have had to have known about and dig for. And I just didn't see a reason to because I got these plants for really reasonable costs and just assumed that they would keep doing their thing. And they have for the most part. Top shelf. These are all plants that I really need to move because they're cooking. The uh, Tritoscanthias, these are the Nanooks. They're doing well considering it's winter time and sometimes those can be a little bit more tricky when I have them in here under the grow lights. They're not a hard plant to keep inside. I wanna make it sound like these are difficult house plants because they're really not. It's just with my growing habits, when I have them out here, they I think I just tend to keep them too wet. So these are, because you know, they are succulents, right? So it's easy to overwater them. I had intended on moving these and my Tretiscantia polita, which is back here behind this orchid, over with the succulents. So I, it's something I should probably do, so just that way I can remember to not water them quite as often. Uh, so having <laughs> really, really sad looking Pharaoh's mask elephant ear up here that I potted this up last minute before, <sighs> I don't know, back in October, probably. I have no idea. It was in a vlog. 
It's one of those plants where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to take it in, but for whatever reason, the prices on them online were skyrocketing. I figured since I probably won't be able to replace them, that I should go ahead and just bring them in just to be safe. And I was glad that I did that because the place that grows those, which is Brian's Botanicals, they release their spring plants $84.99 which is a big heck no for me. That was, I think, $12.99 or $14.99. Would not pay $85 for it. I suppose as far as a cool looking alocasia is you're concerned, that's not awful, but it's still like, that's in a four inch pot. $84.99, absolutely not. No way, sorry, not happening. But that did incentivize me to remember that I need to move these because I think they're getting too much light up here. So I need to pull those down here where there'll be more space between the light and the plant and then put it onto a wicking cord too, because I think it would appreciate having a regular supply of water. There's kind of a better shot of those nanooks there. And they just look like your regular Tritoscanthia nanooks, nothing special there. A little bit of damage on some of them. Again, I think that this light up here is just a smidge too strong. I would bump it up another level, but there's a bike in the way and a bird cage, because <laughs> why not? Doesn't really matter, I need to move those over the succulent shelf like I mentioned. I went ahead and I moved those alocasias down here, the pharaoh's mask I was talking about, because those were definitely cooking. Just were not loving life up there. So I went ahead, moved them down, gave them a quick drink. I expect those to bounce back fairly smoothly. Another elastica here, this is just a small one. This is one of the tanikis. Is that how you even say that? Tanicky, cute little one. This has been a, a mealybug magnet, but I've been okay with it because it seems to be keeping them off of the plants around it. What it really is, it's like a magnet that's drawing them in and it's a lot easier to just have to stay on top of removing them from the one plant than from everything else. There are several plants like that. Coleus is a really good plant to put around to help pull those in. Uh, the Cordon Freticasas, already talked about those um, apparently. So are Heliconias. Never been a problem before. It's actually, while annoying because the mealybugs can be a pain, it's a little bit easier when they're sticking to just a few plants and not everything. So you only have a few things you have to stay on top of with the spring and the rubbing alcohol. As far as everything else back here goes, there are some begonias that are doing okay. I think they'll be happier here pretty soon when they get one a big drink and as the temperatures start to climb in here and get more steady. The Heliconias, these are just rhizomes and divisions that I last minute pulled to bring in. Uh, they went through some cold, but they've been bouncing back from that slowly, but they're coming back from it. Heliconias like heat, and I was keeping things fairly cool in here for the last several weeks. So I expect to see some movement out of those fairly soon. I don't know if they'll bloom, uh, I would think that they would, but you just, you never know. I know two of them are the Andromedas and the other two I think are sassy is the variety. I'm not positive that labels disappeared on all but one. And they all had labels in them. You can still see there's one back there underneath. Well, it's not in foot. You get it. They had labels on them. But the varieties that I have are different enough from each other that when they flower, it'll be easy to decipher them from one another. The Peperomia in here, the Peperomia Frost has been absolutely loving life. It's doing very well on these shelves. And I don't think that, did I put this onto a wicking cord? No, 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 I didn't. That's not even on a wicking cord. So it's just happy and doing much better out here than it was in the house. In the house, I was having to water this one a lot. It really does need a repot. Uh, it's very much overgrown that pot. So. That's something that I should probably get on top of when I'm doing my other repots, but I don't know if I'm going to because it's really, it's just, it's been so happy. Kind of like, a, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's inside, I have to water it a lot more. But out here, it's been totally happy, putting up a whole bunch of new growth. I haven't had to mess with it much at all. Oh, Christmas cactus, and there's also an epiphyllum up here. They've been doing well. I don't think I showed when they flowered but they did and it was pretty. I just forgot to show that, my bad. The kangaroo paw fern over here. Not much to say of that, they're pretty low fuss. A vanda that I thought was going to die, but it has been slowly coming back. So that's good. I have a whole ball of what I think are just dead vandas <laughs> hanging up behind me, vanda orchids from um, last summer. Sometimes when they still have roots on them, even if it's just a stick, you can get them to come back. So I held on to some. These, this is my section of the maybe they'll come back because the roots still green up when I get them wet. 
but I'm not seeing any movement out of them. At least not out of this one. This one over here is still just a stick, but the roots are still moving. It's hard to see. If there's ever any growth on them, I'll talk about them, but otherwise there just isn't much to say because I mean, there's not much to even look at. But I have my fingers crossed for those and I have the other ones over here that like a little bit more light. I think with these orchids, these Vandas, these are the quarter to or semi to I will probably try potting these which isn't typical with this type of orchid. Usually you let them hang like the ones I showed back there. But sometimes with these, uh, the ones that like a lot of sun, they can take full sun. Sometimes I think that they do a little bit better potted. At least if you live someplace where you're moving them in and out of the house, they might appreciate that sort of setup more. So I might give that a shot because they're looking pretty rough. The papaya is putting up some new growth here. Just kind of excited about, this was starting to sort of go into kind of a dormancy and I didn't really want it to, but that makes it less maintenance. So I just sort of was like, you do you. <laughs> if you want to rest all winter, I'll let that happen. But then it started to put up new growth. So apparently it didn't want to rest, which is fine. I'm going to probably lift this up and scoot it closer to the grow lights though. That should help with the growth that it has on there. I may also do the same with, I don't know, this Heliconia is one that needs to go dormant. It's a Hirsuta. I usually have better luck with this type of Heliconia when I just cut them back and let them rest for the winter and they come back just fine in the spring when I move them outside. But I figured I would leave it and let it tell me what it wants to do and I think that it would, <laughs> I think it would like to have a rest. What do you think? Monstera minima, Raptophora, Tetrasperma, whatever you want to call it, doing well. It's, you know, they're also a low fuss plant. I haven't had to do much with it. It has new growth coming up out of it, as you can see right here. I should get this onto a stake or something, don't you think? I mean, it just, I don't want to just let it hang there. I don't know. I feel like it would be better if it were growing up on something. This, I don't like to have too many poles and spikes around. I think it starts to look kind of weird after a while. With plants like this, I generally either go with put it on a pole or get rid of it. Need to do one or the other because, I mean, I could let it grow and hang. People do that with them, but I just think it looks better when it's growing up something. Ficus larata over here. This is the little fiddle. This was in a video last year, sometime last year. Talked about these excellent plants. This one's been really sturdy for me. It's not one of my favorite plants that I have. I almost didn't bring it in. I know I talked about with this plant how with the little fiddles, I prefer them standardized into just a little tree. They look so cool when they're standardized. And the regular ficus lorata, I think I prefer them non-standardized. And so I have them opposite. I had a standardized lorata and then just a regular wild growing little fiddle. They're not easy to come by anymore though. It used to be I would see these at the nursery standardized for like 40 bucks. I don't think that's gonna be happening again for a while. So I decided to hold on to it. Cause like I said, it's a fairly low fuss plant. It just, it doesn't really do anything for me. I mean, it's cute. But like I said, it just doesn't do much for me. I don't know why. The, the Loratas in general, like they haven't really been plants that interested me a lot, at least not in the last like 15 years. I, I just, I don't know if they're maybe because it's just something I've seen since I was a little kid everywhere. So the excitement wore off with them. I'm not sure. The little fiddle, I don't mind it as much because it doesn't take up as much space, but I mean, it's still a fairly, I mean, widened bushy plant. I would say the main reason I held on to this is because it reminds me of the little, the cocoa plumes, those big succulent, succulent. <laughs> those are shrubs that people plant down south and near the beach and they have like big succulenty leaves on them. They're beautiful plants and I love them. I have only had one attempt at growing them as a house plant and it didn't go well, but that was also, I was a kid, so I didn't have any experience and you couldn't just Google stuff to find out what to do for them. So I could give that a shot again, but I figured I'd just hold on to this because it's kind of sort of the same aesthetic. I mean, not really, but if it reminds me of that, then that's good enough. However, when it comes to figs, to ficuses to grow house plants, this one right here kind of bores me. Like it's cute, but eh. The Altissima, on the other hand, fantastic. I have just been loving growing this fig. They are so sturdy. They're so forgiving. They have, you know, the general nature of a fig, of a ficus, not wanting too much water. But with a lot of ficus, they're not always thrilled about being moved in and out of the house. And as somebody who moves their plants outside during the summertime and then back inside during like late fall for the winter, plants that tend to throw a big fit aren't usually ones that I like to keep very many of. 
because they just end up with leaves everywhere. Although this little fiddle's never give me much trouble when I've moved it in and out. But the big Lorata, sometimes it would throw a fit. This Altissima though, Altissima, Altissima, I don't know. It has never thrown a fit about anything. I've had it in the deep shade. I've had it in a more of a medium filtered light outside where it got some direct sun in the morning. It was fine with it. I've gone through spells where I accidentally overwatered it. Didn't seem to mind. Right now it's bone dry and you wouldn't even know. It's just like, hey, I'm cool. Still got new growth coming out. Nice, big leaf. Like, look at those leaves. Look at how big that leaf is. That is a big leaf. And the variegation on it's really pretty. It's not loud and aggressive. It's not that type of variegation that gets to the point where it's almost gaudy. Sometimes plants with yellow variegation specifically are not my favorite. It's just not my taste. Like, I don't think they're ugly. It's just not for me. The variegation though on the Altissima is just so calm and gentle. It's almost like camo, but not quite. And I've gotten a decent amount of growth out of it for being a plant that I haven't had to fuss much with. It was just about this tall when I got it back in probably August, I want to say, and it's put on all of this since then. And that's with minimal effort. Like I said, I really haven't done much for it. I've just watered it. It's been fertilized maybe one time. And it somehow seems to be happy just about anywhere I put it. Now, I haven't put it any place where I knew that it wouldn't be happy, though. So there is that. Like, I haven't stuck it out into direct sun. It's way too small for that. Someday it could take it. These are trees, <laughs> after all. So at some point in this plant's life, it's going to need a lot more sun. But while it's still smaller, I've just been sticking with so like a little bit of direct sun in the morning when it's outside and then filtered throughout the rest of the day. As far as the ficus type plants that I've grown inside and out, I have to say this is probably without a doubt my new favorite. It's because it's not fussy and it's pretty and it's colorful and it has shiny leaves on it. Y'all know I love some shiny glossy leaves. This <laughs> down here, there are some dormant plants. So this is a fireworks plant. I just let these dry out and hang out and keep them fairly cool. I don't water them too much during the winter time. They can be deciduous, so it's not a problem keeping them that way. Once they get outside and it's warm, they flush back out and get covered in flowers and then have hummingbirds and butterflies all over them. The Hamelia patens is what this is specifically. And one of my other dormant plants, it's probably gonna be kind of hard to get to focus here because it's just twigs. This is a <laughs> Pakistaki's Ludia, lollipop plant, golden shrimp plant really, really, really easy to grow. And it's been resting and it's just now starting to wake back up. These normally defoliate when I bring them because I put them usually into a darker spot that's cooler. And I let them stay more on the dry side because it's just easier. If I can have a plant that's going to rest as a dormant plant throughout a chunk of the winter, then I'm fine with that. That's just one less thing to have to worry about. But usually right about now, usually around January to February, the twigs start to wake back up and they start to get the green on them. Then right around May, they'll have all their little flowers on them. You don't have to grow them this way. There have been plenty of years where I went ahead and just let them keep growing all winter long. I didn't move them into a position that would cause them to drop any of their leaves and they did fine too. They were never particularly hard to keep out here, but it's just since they're an option to let kind of die back and chill, I let them. Okay, that's the bulk of everything that's over there. I say, there's probably more, there's not probably, there's a whole bunch more I could talk about over there, but this video is long enough and then combined with last week's, you get it. There's a lot of plants over there, over here specifically. In next week's vlog, I'll go through it and there'll be some repots. I'm going to try and get a lot of what's on this bottom shelf over here onto wicking cord, that they will very much appreciate that. Do some rearranging with the succulents and just basically just get to have fun and play with the plants, which is something I haven't done in a while and I'm really looking forward to it. But first, I must water. Don't need to do anything with thirsty plants except for water them. So I will get right on top of that, give everybody a heavy drink in the morning, give them a day to take that water in, and we'll pick back up. Here's a better shot of these cactus up here. I know they were kind of hard to see last week because I didn't have the lights on, so there's a better shot of the rat tail cactus. Here's a better shot of the burrow's tail. It was just, I had to have this light off last week because I was running the humidifiers and a bunch of other things. I didn't want to overload the circuit. And I realized when I watched that video back to do the editing that it was like kind of hard to see these. Hmm. What was the point of showing them to if you couldn't even see them? So that's a little bit better. They're still thirsty, but I tend to prefer to keep them more on the thirsty side during the winter time, at least with the burrows tails. The rat tail cactus, I am very delicate with it and I still give it some water, but I make sure it dries out a decent amount. When it's as humid as it's been in here, watering them hasn't been a problem. They don't need that much when the air's wet. Until it's getting late, Stramanthi's starting to close up and go to bed. 
as am I. So I hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life and everything's just going beautifully for you. Oh, and I got the name. I finally dug through my screenshots and found the name of this bromeliad. I didn't even found an entire outline that I made to do a video on it. So I'll do a video on it. Get to that hopefully here soon. <laughs> What's going on with your plants? I'm seeing people all over the internet talking about spring like, I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm trying to live in the moment and enjoy what I have here to work with because this is, I mean, it's a lot of work to put it together, so may as well enjoy it, right? But this winter has just been so mild that I'm like really interested to see what February is going to be like because if February is as mild as January, then uh, like where I live, we're in the clear because March usually isn't very bad. It can be cold, but typically come kind of the second week of March, things are pretty mild. Like by mild, I mean, in the 40s, sometimes the 50s with lows in the upper 30s, sometimes lower 30s, occasional dips into the 20s. I'm talking Fahrenheit for all of these temperatures. And that's very nice compared to January, where it's usually below freezing for the entire month. Not this month. This month's been great, but that's not normal. It's been a very weird year. I said I've talked too much and here I am still going. Like I said, comment down below. I love talking to everybody. And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.